My message today is titled, How to Have a Lasting Marriage. I was actually going to title it, How to Have a Romantic Marriage, which I will do later on, but let's start with this one, How to Have a Lasting Marriage. It is said that about a third of all marriages end up in divorce so that tells you marriage is tough and when things get tough people decide that they marry the wrong person and they walk out they leave their mates their spouses their children the family the stability of the home because things have become very very tough but I hope that what I share with you today will help you to stabilize your marriage. And for those of you who are not married, married, it will help you to put some things right before you get into this very serious enterprise. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and uh, I will take it from verse 2 to verse 9. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. From verse 2 to verse number 9. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Amen. It's obvious that Jesus Christ in this passage is focusing on God's perfect will. He's not focusing on circumstances. He's not focusing on people's experiences. He's not focusing on our adjustment to cultural changes but he's establishing that which is permanent. And Jesus says that in the beginning, God desired that there will be one man, one woman, and that the two, when they come together, will become one flesh, and that union is supposed to be permanent. Now Jesus said this knowing also that marriage is tough. And yet he established the foundation of God's word. And it's important, if we're going to be successful with anything we do, instead of following our own desires and our own feelings and our own confusion and frustration, we have to follow God's word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of God remains forever. Why do people get married? in the first place. I'll give you some of the reasons why people get married. I'll give you about six of them. People get married because they say to themselves, I'm growing old. How many of you have heard that before? I'm growing old. So they get married. Some people get married because they need a man or they need a woman. And they are talking about companionship, fellowship, intimacy. Some people also marry because they need to settle down. They said to themselves, I need to settle. Others marry because they say to themselves, I need to have children. Then there are those who also say, all my friends are getting married. And there are also those who say, I need to have sex. Legitimately. So they get married. So there are different 
reasons why people get married but if you notice something about all these reasons they are emergency reasons <laughs> they are all what you call crisis reasons I'm getting old now all these reasons will put you under pressure because when people start thinking I need to have children I need I need a man I need a woman I can't be alone I'm growing they are expressing frustration so you realize that most of the reasons people give for marriage is based on anxiety frustration and pressure now I don't know why you got married and for those of you who are yet to marry some of you are in these questions some of you are so frustrated especially when you're a Christian you're born again and the church is always speaking against fornication and you know that if you have sex outside of marriage in the church you'll get into trouble so you want to marry seriously because there must be a certain kind of freedom a release from bondage and the only way is through marriage when people have emergency reasons for which they get into marriage they don't always count the cost of marriage so in order to fulfill these desires people go about looking for a person who can help them fulfill these desires I read a story somewhere of a young pastor and uh, he had just come out of seminary of training and he was confronted with his first marriage ceremony he had to go and officiate a marriage and he had not done it before he was very anxious he didn't know what to do and so he went to see an older pastor and he said to the older pastor I'm going to have my first marriage I'm going to officiate this marriage I don't know how to do it what would you tell me what if I get stuck and I don't know what to say what do you what should I do so the older pastor says to him don't worry at all whenever you are officiating a marriage and you get stuck somewhere just quote a verse of scripture and you'll be okay you, you, it will take you because a verse of scripture is always appropriate for marriage so the young pastor goes and he starts officiating his marriage the first marriage is ever officiated he goes through the service very very comfortably and then he pronounces them husband and wife then he went blank he didn't know what to say again because normally you know after you do that you're supposed to quote a scripture what God has joined together let no man put asunder so he just went blank and then he remembered the advice from the old pastor that a scripture is always appropriate so after he pronounced them man and wife he looked at them at them he was blank he said father forgive them for they know not what they do I thought that was a prophetic scripture because a lot of people get married and they know not what they are doing remember when you decide to marry that marriage is a permanent union it's permanent it's not part-time it's not temporary it's not boyfriend girlfriend it's permanent and if you want to know how permanent permanent is permanent is permanent if you are 25 years old and you hope to live for 80 years it means for the next how many years 55 years you're going to be stuck with one person that's how permanent it is now many people don't think about growing old with their spouses 
they think about relieving tension. But remember, marriage is permanent. Tell somebody it's permanent. And because it's permanent, when we go into it, our orientation should be more serious than the orientation we take into marriage. You know, there are things that we do, and it takes a long time for us to be ready. If somebody wants to be a doctor, he's going to train for seven years at a university. You want to be a lawyer, you train for about five years at the university. You want to be a pharmacist, you do it about six years. You want to be a pastor, you go to Bible college for at least four years. But when you have want to marry, people want it with no training. Because most of the time, by the time people want to marry, they are on the edge. So any kind of preparation is a hindrance. And that is why it's easy to have successful doctors because they were trained for what they were going to do. Even when you want to drive your car, you go for driving lessons. And get a driver's license before you start driving. But because people have very little preparation before marriage, and because for the rest of their married life they don't make any effort to learn about what they are in anytime challenges come they fall your attitude is very important in marriage attitudes are very important I had a story of a, a couple who were on their honeymoon and uh, the, 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 the new bride the young woman was ironing the husband's trouser and you know she was new to this I'm sure she hadn't ironed a trouser before she's been ironing skirts and blouses now she's married she has the iron trouser so she's ironing the trouser and she bent the trouser there was a big hole in the trouser first experience this is a honeymoon experience the kind of things that can happen on a honeymoon most times people think the moon will be sweet. But most quarrels begin from the honeymoon. So she bent the trouser and she started palpitating. What would this man say? And you know that a marriage can start breaking down from that incident, right from there. So she mastered courage and she went to tell the husband, he says, I've bent your trouser. There's a hole in the trouser. The husband looked at her and smile and say, thank God my leg was not in it. <laughs> That's attitude, isn't it? Now, somebody would have said, you have bent what? And that would be the beginning of their marriage problems. After they've been married for many years, the husband will always come back. Do you remember? On our honeymoon, you bent my trousers. And then the wife will also say, Do you remember on our honeymoon because of that little trouser? You didn't talk to me again. That's the beginning of trouble. Your attitude is very important. You know, when you read fairy tales, Snow White and the Handsome Prince, Sleeping Beauty, and the prince, beauty and the beast, they always end with, and they lived happily ever after. That is the summary, but they don't tell us the details. Because living happily is a summary of the totality of what will happen, but within the living happy, there are major, major problems. All right? Okay, I'm going to give you about five important things you should do to stay happy in your marriage for a very long time. I have not been married for long, so I'm not using my own personal experience. 
if I had been married for 50 years, I could tell you that, uh, you know, this is my life. I've been married just, how many, 15 or 16 years, very young in marriage. There are people here who have been married longer than I've been alive. So I'm not a real specialist. I'm trying. I'm working hard on mine. Okay, the first thing you should do in order to have a lasting marriage is be ready to face the challenges of change. Be ready to face the challenges of change. Things change. And change is a permanent or a constant in life. Things change spiritually, things change emotionally, things change physically. I've seen people who have been married who said, I didn't know that's how he was. I didn't know that's how she was. She tricked me. She didn't show me her true colors. I would not have married. But you know, she showed you her true colors, but you didn't see it. Because at that time you were wearing a spectacle called the love blues. <laughs> and when you wear the love blues spectacle, everything is blue. Everything looks nice. Everything looks purple. So you don't see clearly. So although people show you their true colors, you are blinded by love. As they say, love is strange. Most of the time, people who are outside see all the problems, but you never see it. Because you are under tension. You need to relieve some tension. And also, you are so much in love, you don't see reality. Most of the things you experience in marriage, you saw them but you didn't take note of them. They were not strange. They were there all the time. But you didn't see them. So you must be ready for the challenges of change. The moment you marry, change begins. Some change will be positive. Some will be negative. Some will be depreciation. Others will be appreciation. Some will go up, some will go down. Remember that as human beings, generally, we grow old by the day. So the day you married your husband or your wife, you continue the process of growth. And growth has its upward value and downward value. Its upward value is that as we grow, hopefully we become wiser and better people. But in the same way as we become wiser, we also become weaker physically. So, in growth, there is both appreciation and depreciation. There are changes that take place in every marriage and most times people find it difficult to handle these changes. Let me give you some of the changes. One is parenthood. Parenthood. Once you become parents, everything is going to change. Everything, believe you me. I have four children, I can tell you, at least that one. That once you start having children, everything is going to change. Attention will change, focus will change, money will be stretched. Parenthood has great challenges for couples. Financial challenges, emotional challenges, sexual challenges. You have changes like loss of a job. Although we don't pray that we will lose our jobs. People lose their jobs when they marry. The man who had a stable job gets fired because of hippic. And these days, some of the major changes our generation is faced with is the, genera the change of dealing with a wife who works. When I was a child, Almost all the women I knew worked at home. They probably sold bread or sold kinky or probably made little bed sheets at home, but everything was at home. Nobody went out. So 
I remember when my father closed from work, his, you know, where we were staying, a lot of his office people, not really office factory, but, uh, and um, they, they live there. And uh, I, in the mornings at about 7.15, a big truck, you know, and these, those days the truck, it wasn't a bus, a truck will come and load all of them, my father and all his workers, and go in the morning. And they all jump on the truck and they go to work. And in the evening, the truck brings them back and loads all of them and they all go home. Their wives are sitting at home. They are cooking for them and they go and sit down, cross their legs, ask for the food and eat. But it's changed. These days, you come home, whether it's a truck that brought you or you brought yourself or you walked home you get home and the key is with the next door neighbor so if you are the man you go and open the door and nobody's waiting for you because your wife's boss has given her an assignment and she has to finish by 9 30 before she comes home so it's change if you don't adjust to these changes you can create a lot of problems the idea of a wife that works outside the home. The change of in-laws. You thought your parents were enough until you added your husband's parents too. You thought yours were bad. Then you added your husband's parents in addition to yours who were giving you trouble. And you have four old people <laughs> to deal with <laughs> all of them also going through changes some of them are growing old they are getting sicker and weaker and you've inherited all of them when you were married you thought it was romantic until you saw four old people showing up so that's a change relocation relocation you move from place to place when i got married to my wife we moved so hard after a point i forgot where we had stayed before because we kept moving you know the first house we lived in we were there for a few weeks you know and um, the landlord came and said he's collecting his house and uh, you you i prayed i told him i was a pastor as a man I'm a man of god he had no value for me as a pastor no value he said you have to leave and i'm telling you, when they start moving you that way they really move you they move you till your heart is paining you but they moved us and believe you me they moved us my wife was pregnant and we didn't know where to go the next time i mean you're moved and you don't know where to stay a day after but we went to stay with some church members which has its own complications. I don't want to get into that. I need to keep my members. can complain about them. It has its own complications. And so on and so forth. We moved probably about five, six times within a very short time. We lived, when, when we married, at a point we lived, my wife and I, two other pastors and their wives, in three bedrooms. Each room had a couple in it with children and maid. So the maid servants were crashing in the, in, the, in the kitchen and in the bathroom. You give instruction and it's, 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 it's over 10. Food in the fridge is anointed in the Holy Ghost and all kinds of things begin to happen. So these are changes. They put stress. You have to learn to deal with them. Infertility. Infertility. Everybody marries hoping to have children, but sometimes it delays. Sometimes it delays. And it can put a lot of stress on your marriage. That's when a lot of couples start insulting one another. Aging. I've talked about that. Sickness. Sometimes disability. Although you don't pray for it, sometimes things happen you didn't pray for. And you didn't anticipate. These are changes that will occur 
in most marriages and you can think of several other changes that occur when changes take place a couple must be ready to cope with them and in a later time I will teach on some of those things secondly you must be ready to accept what cannot be changed be ready to accept what cannot be changed somebody says you enter into marriage with your two eyes open afterwards close one eye because you see in marriage there are things which you can't change and one of the things that every couple must get used to that they can't change is they can't change the other person you cannot change your wife and you cannot change your husband if you went into marriage deciding or desiring to change people you have frustration a lot of people marry based on sympathy they see somebody who is a wreck and all of a sudden they have this you know hero anointing vicarious thing upon themselves they say i'm going to change this person i will marry him and make him a gentleman let me tell you what his mother could not do you can't do so if 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 when you were courting your husband he eats and you hear the sound and you hear all these chum chum noise and you say i, I will polish him up when i marry remember his mother couldn't change it and you can't so if you married him in spite of his eating habits adapt to it you either put cotton wool in your ears or you also start eating that way because the two shall become one flesh remember <laughs> you can't change your partner you can't change your wife you can't change your husband the only person you can change is yourself instead of trying so hard to change the other person try so hard to change yourself most of the time it is the way you see a problem that makes it a problem i talked about that man uh, whose wife bent his his uh, trouser it could be problem but if you don't see it as a problem it doesn't become a problem i know somebody who's say pastor so what if afterwards he keeps burning your trouser every day every day he's bent she's burning your trouser do you always say my leg was not in my leg was not in it no i know that when mistakes are repeated over and over they become very difficult on you and your tolerance level you know is stretched too much but most of the time it is when you decide to complain about something that is wrong and how you respond to the complaint you can bring things out which are wrong but if things are brought out which are wrong in such a way that they hit against the other person it doesn't penetrate it is bounced back because human beings are made in such a way that anything that affects their dignity and puts them down they'll resist it that's how God made human beings they will fight it if it's against their dignity and that's why if you correct your husband in such a way that you put him down he won't see the correction he will see you as trying to put him down and all the good intention will be lost and in the same way if you correct your wife in such a way that you put her down she would not see your good intention and she'll resist it so yes after two trousers are bent you must find a way of correcting and one of the best ways is iron your own trouser that, that that's a short shortcut i mean iron your own trouser what if you marry and you don't like your wife's food you get adjusted to it there is something about acquired taste how many of you have heard that acquired taste do you know that some of the food we eat in this country is very very funny kinky and pepper can, can you imagine somebody eating kinky and pepper the stew is pepper 
but we eat kinky and pepper with fish with all relish why it's acquired taste it's not nice but we're trained with it people who eat kinky for the first time after they've grown say that it bites that's one thing people who visit this country is part of all Ghanaian hospitality kinky they can't touch it they can eat fufu because you swallow it but kinky it will bite your jaws because it's fermented corn but we eat kenke easily because we have acquired the taste we've gotten used to it and that's what marriage is all about get used to your wife's food it may bite you the first time but if you persist it will be friendly to you all right so be ready to accept what you cannot change you can't change your spouse but you can change yourself. If you make it your crusade to change the person you are married to, I'm telling you, you have frustration every day of your married life. All your life will be unhappy. But if you decide, I'm going to change my own attitude to the way he does things. I'm going to change my attitude to the way he dresses. I'm going to change my attitude to the way he behaves and the way he walks. If you change that attitude, you see that it doesn't really matter the way you have made it to be. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned to be content in every circumstance. Philippians 4, 11. It's important for us to learn to turn the process of changing our spouses over to God. Turn it over to God. Begin to pray for your spouse and ask God, to bring those changes in their lives and God will only do that if we don't help him but we get out of the way if you've committed your spouse to God your husband to God or your husband your wife to God then stay out and let God do his work and remember that when God is doing his work he may not do it in the twinkling of an eye most of us are used to always expecting a miracle you pray for your wife today and you expect tomorrow morning she will change. No, it takes time because God has to work with her own will and there has to be submission gradually until the point where real change can be seen. Changes are very, very slow. And whilst God is working on your partner, you focus on improving yourself. The third thing you must do, I hope you are following it. The first one, was be ready to face the challenges of change. Number two, be ready to accept what you cannot change. Number three, express affection and appreciation daily. Isn't it amazing that when people are courting, they are more affectionate? And when they marry, they become very boring. If you go to a restaurant and you see couples at the restaurant, you can tell who is married and who is not. I, I, I can just tell you, go to any restaurant and do this survey. Tell them, this is my pastor has given me an assignment to do a survey of people's attitude in restaurants. The attitude of the, husband, of the married people is totally different from the attitude of the unmarried people. Those who are unmarried who are courting are talking together and they are joyful and they are having fun and there's so much excitement you see so much dialogue going on those who are married are very quiet the husband is looking to the west the wife is looking to the east they have nothing to talk about because it's been a long time since they talked about themselves since they started having children, all the talk is, I could see school fees. Have you paid? I haven't paid. What did the teacher say? He didn't say, what about the trouser? Have you hemmed it? That's all they talk about. Their conversation is all based on their children. So when you leave them together, they are total strangers. I read some research findings that will be helpful to all husbands here. I quoted it to my wife yesterday. And this is scientific husbands listen this is directly to you this is real scientific research finding 
it has been found out now you can all decide to practice it after I teach it it has been found out scientifically that husbands who kiss their wives every morning live an average of five years longer than husbands who don't how many of you want long life <laughs> hey this is scientifically proven husbands who kiss their wives every morning live on the average five years longer than those who don't you have the liberty to practice it and those husbands who kiss their wives every morning have fewer car accidents <laughs> this is scientific i'm not making it up i i read it i researched it fewer car accidents <laughs> fewer car accidents they are sick 50% less than those who don't kiss. And they earn, they earn 20 to 30% more than those who don't kiss. Scientific. There is something about kissing your wife that will give you life. <laughs> I know African men kiss under darkness. I know that. I, 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 I will forgive you for all your sins. But, but don't wait till the lights are out then you're going mm -hmm. <laughs> looking for a lip do it in the morning how many of you want to live five years longer you want to earn 30 percent more have fewer car accidents <laughs> kiss your wife now somebody will say what about the wives i'm sure it applies to them too but this was made research was made on men who kiss their wives that being the case we must strive to inject more affection into our relationships marriage doesn't have to be boring you don't need to go outside of a marriage to have excitement. You can have it right in your marriage. If you make it boring, both of you will be looking out. If you make it exciting, you can't wait to meet. You must make your marriage exciting. And there must be affection. Affection is in little phone calls, little notes, little words nice words spoken at home nice words through the children let the children carry your affection from one to another that's one of the things we let our children do i tell i'll call my children i say i have a very important message to give your your mother tell her there's a gentleman in that room over there who is crazy about her and the children will laugh, hey, oh daddy, oh daddy. <laughs> but they learn it. And then they'll go and deliver the message. And my wife will respond and we'll go back and forth. To help the children also to be affectionate. To know that their parents are not parents, but they are also lovers. They are not mommy and daddy. They are sweethearts also. Because if you make your children see you as two disconnected entities that have been given by God to supervise them, they, they see no love, they see no affection, they see no tenderness, no holding of hands, no chatting, no being in a room. When my wife and I get into the room, we can stay in the room the whole day. You can stretch your imagination whatever you want. I say we stay the whole day. <laughs> That's up to you. 
but remember don't sin in your thoughts but you can imagine but I say we can stay in the room the whole day I enjoy being with my wife more than anybody if I'm locked in a room or on an island with her for the rest of my life I'll be fine that's true <laughs> I will be fine. I like talking to her. I like her company. And I like showing affection to her. And you have to learn to show appreciation. One of the things we have to learn to say is thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you is a very simple word, but it carries so much meaning. Many husbands never stop to thank their wives after a meal. How many of you know how tough it is to cook? Cooking is hard, especially in these days when the women are working for as long hours as the men. Don't take for granted the cup of tea your wife gave you because she gets as tired as you are. She gets as stressed as you are. She meets the same demands you are meeting and she comes home and cooks for you. And some men can even go to their stand and say, I don't like the food. Anyway, I'll stop there. I won't go any further. But learn to say thank you. And the same thing with the women. Learn to say thank you. Show some affection. They buy you something. Because you earn money and they also earn money. You are both workers. And you are all in hippic Ghana. So if your husband decides to buy you something, don't take it for granted. Thank him for it. If he decides to take you out for lunch, thank him. My wife always thanks me anytime I take her out. And it makes me feel good because I just feel like more. Because although you can take it for granted, yes, he's supposed to do it, but thank him. When your husband pays the children's school fees, thank him. Don't think it's his job. He's done it. Learn to say thank you for paying the children's school fees. Thank you for buying those clothes for the kids. It's his job, yes. But it's tough. And if he does it, we have to show appreciation. Husbands and wives must constantly show appreciation for what they do to each other. Number four. You must commit yourself to a lasting relationship a lasting relationship marriage is not part time and there is no half time in marriage it's lasting Jesus said and the two shall become one flesh and what God has joined together let no man put a son when you are one flesh you never get the idea of pack and go there are husbands who threaten their wives. If you don't change, you will pack and go. And there are wives who also threaten their husbands. I'm tired, oh, I'm going. When we are committed to a lasting relationship, that thought never strikes your mind. And that vocabulary should be totally eradicated from your mouth. Never use separation as a threat in your marriage never it's lasting it's permanent don't insinuate separation don't use it to threaten one another don't use it to punish one another our language should affirm the union and its permanence there is nowhere we are going except together one of the greatest desires of every couple is the desire should be the desire to grow old together to grow old together to be weak together and still be in love it's not just about being young together but growing old with all its complications we must do it 
graciously and beautifully together. This thing is permanent. For those of you who keep threatening your wives that if some, something doesn't happen, they should go back. No, there is no going back anywhere. There is no turning back. The day you left your parents, the door was closed and there is no door handle on the outside. You never go back. You stay. What if somebody says, what, what, what if I'm not happy? Work it out. There is nothing two people cannot solve if they desire to solve it. Even the Soviet Union and the United States are now partners. Ghana and Togo have open border. <laughs> Even North Korea is opening up. Germany and England are friends. So what are you talking about? Saying, we can't get on. There's nobody in this world you can't get on with. The thing is, if you locate your attitude at a point and say, I can't get on, and you never look at it differently, you imprison yourself in your own prejudice. But you can get on if you choose to get on. In, the, in marriage, there is nothing like incompatibility. All human beings are compatible. And if you're married, you are compatible. The only thing is what needs to happen is going to come from both of you. Both of you must make a commitment to make it work. And if you decide, it will work. I'm yet to see any marriage that is unworkable. Every marriage is workable. So commit yourself to a lasting relationship. Don't make jokes about divorce. Don't make jokes about separation. Don't insult one another and, and, and use that as a joke. Because Satan will use your words against you. And destroy you with your own words. No matter the challenges of marriage, it can work. No matter the challenges. Number five, that's the last one. Commit yourself to God with all your heart. When we commit ourselves to God, it helps us to cope with change and the challenges of change. Because the word of God gives us the answers on how to face changes in our marriage. When we commit ourselves to God and his word, it helps us to deal with all the stages of our lives from birth to death and gives us answers. Whilst everything change will change, God never changes and his word never changes. If you build your marriage on the word of God, there will be changes. You will grow old. All kinds of things may happen. You could get sick. You could go into financial difficulties. Changes in the office can affect you. But the word of God will help you to walk through it. The people with the word of God have not been promised a problem-free world. We have problems like everybody. If you're a Christian, you have problems like everybody and maybe even more. But you have a resource which helps you to deal with your problems better than other people. That resource is called the word of God the Spirit of God, the power of God. God's Word, God's Spirit, God's power is available to us and helps us. And if we commit ourselves to say, God, we want to do your will, no difficulty in marriage will be enough to destroy that union. When we commit ourselves to God's word, it helps us to accept the things we cannot change. Because we understand that all is vanity. Most of the things we worry about are nothing. Today they may seem very difficult, but tomorrow it's like nothing. It's like going back to the place you used to be when you were a child. 
And any time I go to where I grew up as a child, there is one experience that always impresses me. There was a big gutter. I had problem jumping. And for me, my whole world was that gutter. Because it was the challenge of bravery in our neighborhood to jump the gutter. And for me, my whole life, I mean, everything is, I have to jump the gutter. And those of us who couldn't jump will have to descend into the gutter and climb the other way. And people will laugh at you. You are a girl and you are all kinds of things. I remember when I went to secondary school, Form 1, I was meditating on that gutter. I was away for three months. And when I arrived back from secondary school, I put my trunk down. I ran straight to where the gutter is. And that was the first day I jumped it. Nobody saw it, but I turned around and said, I'm a man now. <laughs> but since I've grown, I go back to look at that gutter, and it's very small. So I said, why was it a big deal at that time? Because of the way I saw it. God's word can change your view and your perspective so that something that looks like a big deal and you look like you can never jump it one time God shows it to you in another way and it's like nothing then you begin to wonder why was I even bothered about this all of it is vanity the problems you think are impossible are nothing the habits you think you cannot tolerate in the other person they are nothing God's word changes our perspective and our perception and God's word teaches us how to value one another God teaches us how to value one another when you build your marriage on the word of God you will value one another you can't insult your husband you can't insult your wife you can't put your husband down oh yes you will get angry but your spirit will be controlled by the Holy Spirit so that your anger does not become destructive. You can train your tongue to speak words of grace, soft answers that turn away wrath. You don't fuel confrontation and controversy, but you reduce tension by the words of your mouth. That's what submission to God's word is all about. When you're submitted to God's word, you don't need your spouse to be faithful. You need God to be faithful. I'm faithful to my wife, not because of her, but because of God. And if I'm committed to God and I want to remain faithful to him, I will become faithful to my wife. But if my wife is the only reason why I want to be faithful, then when she changes, I have no basis for faithfulness again. But there is one who never changes. And when you are committed to honoring him and pleasing him and doing his will, then no matter the stress you go through, when everything changes, because he never changes, you will also remain faithful unto him. Five things. Be ready to face the challenges of change. Be ready to accept what you cannot change. Commit yourself to a lasting relationship. No. Express affection and appreciation daily. Commit yourself to a lasting relationship. And commit yourself to God with all your heart. Thank you for making time to listen to Living Word. To correspond with Dr. Mensah Autoville, please write to Living Word, International Central Gospel Church, PO Box 7933, Accra, Ghana. Telephone 233-21-688-000. Fax 233-21-688-007. Email autoville at centralgospel.com. For further information on other messages by Dr. Mensa Otabil, please email tapes at centralgospel.com and visit www.centralgospel.com.